Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on humidification of inspired gases. Introduction. This is a standard examination subject. Artificial humidification of dried inspired gases is important in the context of both anesthesia and intensive care. Failure to provide humidified respiratory support results in unwanted complications. Therefore, the anesthetist needs to be equipped with a fundamental understanding of the principles of humidification and the equipment used to provide it. Methods of measurements of humidity may also be asked in exams. Physical principles of humidification Gases and vapors Basic definitions of principles related to humidification A gas is a state of matter formed when a liquid is heated above its critical temperature. In the gaseous state, the molecules are in constant motion without a structure. The mean distance separating individual molecules is great and the van der Waals force between individual molecules is negligible. Vapor is matter in its gaseous state below its critical temperature. Unlike a gas, the molecules are capable of re-entering the liquid phase at any one temperature. An equilibrium occurs where the number of molecules leaving the liquid equals the numbers entering it. Critical temperature is the temperature above which a vapor can no longer be liquefied by any amount of pressure. Above this temperature, the substance is a gas. Vapor pressure is the pressure created by the molecules that have left the liquid phase in favor of gaseous phase, measured in kPa. Saturated vapor pressure is the vapor pressure when the liquid and vapor phase are in equilibrium. Latent heat of vaporization is the heat required to convert 1 gram of a substance from the liquid to gaseous phase, measured in joules per gram. Oiling point is the temperature at which saturated vapor pressure equals ambient pressure. Medical gases from either a pipe supply or cylinders are cool with minimal water content. Oxygen, for example, is stored in bulk within a vacuum-insulated evaporator and the contents are kept at negative 150 degrees Celsius. Kindly refer to the video discussing central gas supply, gas cylinders, and gas and vapors for further details. Humidity refers to the amount of water vapor present in the atmosphere and is subdivided into two types, absolute humidity and relative humidity. Absolute humidity is defined by the mass of water vapor that is present in a given volume of gas at a specified temperature and pressure. SI unit is grams per meter cube. Alternative measurement unit is mg per liter. Absolute humidity is temperature dependent. At 20 degrees Celsius, it is 17 grams per meter cube. At 37 degrees Celsius, it is 44 grams per meter cube. Relative humidity is the ratio of the vapor pressure of water in a volume of gas compared with the saturated vapor pressure of water in that same volume at a specified temperature and pressure. It can also be defined in terms of mass of water as the ratio of the mass of water vapor present in a volume of gas to the mass required to fully saturate that same volume at that temperature and pressure. It is usually expressed as a percentage. The humidity graph attempts to demonstrate how a fixed amount of water vapor in the atmosphere will lead to a variable relative humidity depending on the temperature and highlights that upper airways at room temperature can achieve full saturation by the addition of 27 grams per meter cube of water vapor. When relative humidity is 100%, the RH line crosses the y-axis at 8 grams per meter cube and rises as a parabola that crosses 17 grams per meter cube at 20 degrees Celsius and 44 grams per meter cube at 37 degrees Celsius. The 50% relative humidity line crosses each point on the x-axis at a y-value half that of the 100% RH line. A fixed quantity of water vapor can result in varying relative humidity depending on the temperature. As temperature increases in a closed system, the relative humidity decreases. If the temperature decreases, the relative humidity increases. The dew point is the temperature at which the relative humidity of air exceeds 100% and the water condenses out of the vapor phase to form liquid. 
Physiology of humidification within the airways. During nose breathing, inspired air becomes heated and fully saturated as it passes distally to the alveoli. The nose functions as an excellent humidifier. Highly vascularized nasal mucosa facilitates heat and moisture exchange. Nasal turbinates enhances humidification and maximizes the transfer of heat and water by its high available surface area and by altering the characteristics of airflow. As the nasal mucosa gives up water to the dry inspired air, some heat loss through massic enthalpy of evaporation occurs. Warm expired air is cooled with subsequent condensation of the water vapor. Compared with the amount of water added during inspiration, only a proportion will condense during expiration. Within a 24-hour period, about 250 mL of water is lost from the respiratory tract. Within the airways, humidification is achieved by evaporation of water from the airway surface liquid contained within the mucus present on all respiratory surfaces. Respiratory mucus consists of two interacting layers, a luminal gel layer containing mucin and a deeper aqueous layer which is produced by serous cells. Mucus provides a mechanism for humidification and entraps inhaled debris. Embedded within the mucus layer are cilia, which beats 1000 times per minute in a coordinated fashion to transport mucus and debris back up to the pharynx. When humidity of an inspired gas is too low, greater amounts of water evaporate from the mucus. There is initially movement of water from the aqueous layer to the gel layer, but this compensation is limited with eventual increases in viscosity of the mucus, and this may obstruct bronchi and tracheal tubes, increasing airway resistance, causing atelectasis, increases the propensity to infection, reduces FRC, reduces compliance and increases ventilation perfusion mismatch. At a relative humidity of less than 50%, mucus flow is significantly reduced. There is loss of cilia number and function. Impaired mucociliary elevator further increases atelectasis via sputum retention and this increases intrapulmonary shunt. Damage may start with as little as one hour of exposure to dry gas, with prolonged exposure to cool, dry gases, cilia disappear, and tracheal epithelium undergoes keratinization, ulceration, and necrosis. Pulmonary complications for patients undergoing anesthesia with dry gases exceeds that of patients breathing humidified gases. Conversely, if the humidity of inspired gas is too high, there is reduction of viscosity of the mucus, this results in increased mucus volume which can overwhelm the mucociliary elevator. Superadded infection and risk of atelectasis occurs through condensation of water droplets throughout the airways. Significant heat gain may also occur and may result in thermal injury to airway mucosa. Normal values of absolute humidity at room temperature 20 degrees Celsius is 17 grams per meter cube. In the oropharynx, Temperature range is 30 to 37 degrees Celsius and absolute humidity range is 28 to 32 grams per meter cube. In the upper trachea, at 34 degrees Celsius, absolute humidity is 34 grams per meter cube. In the alveoli, at 37 degrees Celsius, the absolute humidity is 44 grams per meter cube. The isothermic saturation boundary. Normally, inspired air is warmed to 37 degrees Celsius and fully saturated at the isothermic saturation boundary, which is about 5 cm below the carina. Temperature and humidity are constant distal to the ISB, while the airways proximal to the ISB functions as heat and moisture exchangers. The isothermic saturation boundary moves distally when cold and dry gases are inhaled, as a greater proportion of the airways have to participate in heat and moisture exchange to achieve full saturation. Clinical relevance of humidification. The isothermic saturation boundary and the effects of tracheal intubation. Normally, the ISB is about 5 cm below the carina as mentioned. The upper respiratory mucosa contains pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium with goblet cells that maintains the mucus layers. Beyond the terminal bronchioles, the lining contains many fewer globet cells and has a simple cuboidal epithelium. 
This structure is less able to sustain the efficient humidification of the upper airway. Tracheal intubation moves the ISP distally. Gases are thus delivered to parts of the respiratory tract that are less able to humidify them if they are dry. Why do we humidify inspired gases in anesthesia or critical care? Reasons include to reduce heat loss and maintain normal thermia, to protect the respiratory mucosa against drying, keratinization and inflammation, to reduce the viscosity of secretions, to improve mucociliary clearance, to provide a moist physiological surface for gas exchange at the alveolar level, to prevent consequences of failure to humidify respiratory gases. What are the consequences of failure to humidify respiratory gases? Drying and crusting of secretion occurs, which increases the viscosity of the mucus, resulting in mucus plugging and obstruction of bronchi or tracheal tubes. This increases airway resistance, causes atelectasis and shunting, increases the propensity to infection, reduces FRC and compliance, increases VQ mismatch, and causes impact gas exchange. There is reduction in ciliary activity and impairment of the mucociliary escalator. Impact mucociliary elevator further increases atelectasis via sputum retention, and this increases shunting. Inflammatory changes in the ciliated pulmonary epithelium may occur. Drying, keratinization, and ulcerations of parts of the tracheal bronchial tree may occur and may result in necrosis of epithelium and squamous cell metaplasia if the lack of humidification of inspired gases is prolonged. Heat loss occurs by latent heat of vaporization as dry anesthetic gases are humidified in the respiratory tract. When a patient is intubated, the upper airways are bypassed and cool gases are delivered directly to the trachea. Water and energy are then required to humidify and warm the gas. Heat loss due to warming of cold, dry inspired gases can be significant in children. After 90 minutes of ventilation with non-humidified gases, the core temperature of anesthetized children reduces by 0.75 degrees Celsius. Heat loss from warming cold inspired air costs about 2 watts per hour and heat loss from humidifying dry air costs about 8 watts per hour. Humidifying and warming inspired dry gases may account for up to 15% of the body's total basal heat expenditure. Patients at risk for the negative effects of failure to humidify respiratory gases includes those undergoing prolonged anesthesia, those with pre-existing respiratory diseases in whom the impairment of important pulmonary defense functions will be more significant, those at extremes of age, and all intensive care patients. Effects of over-humidification of respiratory gases includes reduction of viscosity of mucus, increased mucus volume, overwhelming of the mucociliary elevator, superadded infection and atelectasis due to condensation of water droplets, retention of secretions, surfactant dilution, bronchial infiltration by neutrophils, reduction in pulmonary compliance, and widening of the AA oxygen gradient. The optimal level of heat and humidity that needs to be provided has not been defined. The rationale behind humidification of inspired gases is clear, and we have a good understanding to problems related to under and over humidification. Targets of humidification are variable and range from minimal humidification to prevent tracheal tube occlusion to physiological equivalence or beyond to achieve optimal mucociliary clearance with supraphysiological gas temperatures. Measurement of the delivered humidity is also infrequently undertaken. Humidification and non-invasive ventilation. During NIV, the usual physiological mechanisms for humidification are not bypassed. However, the inspiration of dry, cold medical gases compared with normal ambient room air during NIV may still suggest benefit for humidification. During NIV, factors contributing to significant drying of airways includes high minute ventilation, unidirectional airflow, and presence of air leaks. Healthy volunteers undergoing a trial of NIV reported severe discomfort related to mouth dryness in the absence of humidification. Airway resistance and 
the secretion load may also build up during NIV with no humidification. This may have an implication on both the requirement for and difficulty of any future intubation. In many modes of NIV, humidification is not always an integral component of the system. There are currently no data suggesting improved outcomes with the addition of humidification to NIV. Humidity of the operation theatre It is also of some importance to maintain the relative humidity of the operation theatre environment at an appropriate level and traditionally, the relative humidity is kept around 50%. High humidity is uncomfortable. Low humidity increases the risk of static electricity buildup, which increases the risk of fires and explosions and increases patient heat loss during surgery. Methods of measuring humidity Hygrometers are used to measure humidity. Depending on the device, it will either measure absolute or relative humidity. The hair hygrometer, the hair, either human hair or animal hair, which is linked to a spring and pointer, elongates as humidity increases. As the hair lengthens, it moves a pointer displayed on a scale to indicate the relative humidity. It is accurate between relative humidity measurements of 30 to 90%. The wet and dry bulk hygrometer, also known as the psychrometer, the temperature difference between the two thermometers relates to the evaporation of water around the wet bulb, which in turn relates to ambient humidity. One mercury thermometer exists at ambient temperature and reads the true air temperature. The bulb on the other thermometer is surrounded by a wet wick. This thermometer reads a lower temperature due to the cooling effect exerted by the latent heat of vaporization. The rate of evaporation of water from the wick depends on the ambient humidity. The temperature difference between the two thermometers can be looked up in tables to obtain a predetermined value for relative humidity. This is a cumbersome technique. Rignox hygrometer. This is a more accurate technique in which air is bubbled through ether within a silver tube until water droplets start to condense on the outside of the tube. The temperature at which condensation appears on the outer surface is the dew point which is the temperature to which air must be cooled, at constant pressure to become fully saturated. The ratio of saturated vapor pressure at the dew point to the SVP at ambient temperature gives the relative humidity. The result is determined from reference tables. Humidity transducers. As a substance such as lithium chloride absorbs atmospheric water, there is a change in either capacitance or electrical resistance. The degree of change in capacitance or resistance is measured and displayed as absolute humidity measurement after electronic processing. Mass spectrometry. Benefits includes it is extremely accurate, has a rapid response time, and simultaneous measurements of different compounds is possible. Disadvantages includes it is large and expensive, and thus it is not routinely used. Mechanism of action. Gas sample is introduced into an ionization chamber. Some of its molecules pass through an electron beam to become charged. Ion particles are then accelerated out of the chamber to reach a strong magnetic field. The magnetic field deflects the particles according to their mass. Ions that are too heavy bends less than those that are light. Only ions of the right mass enters the detector. The molecules of interest is detected and recorded on a display. Optical hygrometers. Detection and determination of the water vapor concentration takes place through measurements of optical properties. They form a large class of devices which can be divided into subgroups on the basis of the wave band used for the detection of water vapor, such as visible, infrared or ultraviolet, the fraction of light which is detected after interaction with the sample, for example, the transmitted, reflected or absorbed fraction, and the spectral width of light which can be divided into monochromatic, polychromatic or reference light with continuous spectrum. The principle of the method is based on the absorption of electromagnetic radiation which is to determine the attenuation of 
radiation in a wave band that is specific to water vapor absorption along the path between a source of the radiation and a receiving device. The intensity of the transmitted radiation is related to the analyte concentration C and this relation is expressed by the Beer-Lambert law. The Beer-Lambert law consists of the Beer's law and the Lambert's law. Beer's law states that the absorbance of light passing through a medium is proportional to the concentration of the medium and its molar extinction coefficient. Lambert's law states that the absorbance of light passing through a medium is proportional to the path length. Beer-Lambert law states that the absorbance of light equals molar extinction coefficient epsilon times path length L times concentration of the medium C. The Beer-Lambert principle states that when light energy at certain wavelengths travel through a gas, a certain amount of the energy is absorbed by the water within the path. The amount of light energy lost is related to the concentration of water in that sample. Gravimetric hygrometer measures the mass of an air sample and compares this to the mass of an equal amount of dry air. It is very accurate and measures absolute humidity. Methods of humidification of inspired gases Classification of humidification systems Humidification systems are classified according to their requirement for an energy, water supply or both, and they can be classified as passive or active humidifiers. Passive humidifiers do not require an external power or water supply. Example includes HME. Active humidifiers require an external power, water supply or both, and consists of a humidifier and delivery system, which add water vapor to a flow of gas independent of the patient. Examples include bubble humidifiers, nebulizers, and heated humidifiers. The performance and safety standards for medical respiratory gas humidifiers is covered by the International Organization of Standardization. What are the characteristics of the ideal humidifier? This includes able to warm and humidify gases to physiological conditions, has low resistance to flow and low dead space, provides microbiological protection to the patient, maintains body temperature, safe and convenient to use, and economical. There is little conclusive evidence to suggest the superiority of one humidification device over the other. Many variables need to be considered and the choice of the device needs to take into account the status of the patient, the duration for which the humidification device will be necessary, mode of ventilation, and the underlying respiratory pathology when providing humidification. The HME Heat and Moisture Exchange Filter These are compact, widely used, inexpensive, passive and effective humidifiers. HMEs are easy and convenient to use with no need of an external power source. The British Standard describes them as devices intended to retain a portion of the patient's expired moisture and heat and return it to the respiratory tract during inspiration. Efficiency this is gauged by the proportion of heat and moisture it returns to the patient. Since HMEs are passive systems, they are unable to attain 100% efficiency, but which may attain 70% efficiency. Adequate humidification is achieved with a relative humidity of 60-70%. to HMEs should be able to deliver an absolute humidity of a minimum of 30 grams per meter cube water vapor at 30 degrees Celsius. Inspired gases are warm to temperatures of between 29 to 34 degrees Celsius. Components of the HME includes pots, the head, and the HME medium. There are two pots designed to accept 15 and 22 mm size tubings and connections. Some designs have provision for connection of a sampling tube for gas and vapor concentration monitoring. In the head of the HME, there contains a medium with hygroscopic material within a sealed unit. The volume of the head ranges from 7.8 mL in pediatric practice to 100 mL. Increasing volumes increases apparatus dead space. Composition of the HME medium is varied. It is a mesh with a large surface area and can be made of ceramic fiber, corrugated aluminum or paper, cellulose, metallized polyurethane foam or stainless steel fibers. 
One such example includes fibers that are formed into non-woven sheet. This sheet is pleated to give a large surface area and then fitted into a reasonably sized device. The sheet is coated in a hygroscopic gel such as lithium chloride. Alternatively, filters can be electrostatically charged and generally these do not need to be pleated. Electrostatic filters can be tribocharged or fibrillated coronal charged filters. Electrostatic filters have less material so present less of a resistance to breathing. Some designs have a pore size of 0.2 micrometer to filter bacteria, viruses and particles from the gas flow in either direction. They are called heat and moisture exchanging filters. Functions of the HME includes to humidify and warm inhaled gases and to filter bacteria, viruses and particles. HMEs are placed in the circuit between the patient and the Y connector of the inspiratory and expiratory limbs. HMEs contain hygroscopic materials such as calcium chloride that attracts moisture from the atmosphere within a sealed unit. Hygroscopic substances have the ability to attract and hold water molecules from the atmosphere and this may increase the amount of water condensed on expiration. A HME uses the principles of latent heat, which has been described previously. As warm expired gases passes over the HME, water vapor condenses on the hygroscopic material when warm expired gases cool. The condensed water vapor and HME is warmed by the specific heat of the exhaled gas and the latent heat of condensation of water. Water is absorbed by the hygroscopic salt and heat is retained in the material. During inspiration, as the dry inspiratory gas passes over the layer, the heat on the filter warms the gas and the water molecules bound to the salt are released, increasing humidity. The element cools down prior to the next exhalation. HME mediums may be hydrophobic as well. The greater the temperature difference between each side of the HME, the greater the potential for heat and moisture to be transferred during exhalation and inspiration. The HME humidifier requires about 5 to 20 minutes before it reaches its optimal ability to humidify dry gases. The performance of the HME is affected by the water vapor content and temperature of the inspired and exhaled gases. Inspiratory and expiratory flow rates affecting the time the gas is in contact with the HME medium, hence the heat and moisture exchange. The volume and efficiency of the HME medium also affects its performance. The larger the medium, the greater the performance. Low thermal conductivity, i.e. poor heat conduction, helps to maintain a greater temperature difference across the HME, increasing the potential performance. Another function of the HME is to filter bacteria, viruses and particles. The filter has a pore size of 0.2 microns. This function does not depend on the two-way gas flow, which is essential for their function as humidifiers. Some studies have suggested that HME devices incorporating a bacterial filter may help reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Problems and issues when using the HME Increased dead space This occurs especially when smaller tidal volumes are utilized, for example, during lung protective ventilation. HMEs may be blocked by secretions and this impairs ventilation and increases airway resistance. When airway resistance increases, there is an increase in work of breathing. The estimated increase in resistance to flow due to HME ranges from 0.1 to 2 cmH2O depending on the flow rate and the device used. Obstruction of the HME with mucus or because of the expansion of saturated heat exchanging material may occur and this increases resistance. Accumulation of water in the filter housing, if used for prolonged periods, also increases resistance. Risk of infection. It is recommended that HMEs are used for a maximum of 24 hours and for a single patient only. HMEs function poorly at high minute volumes, more than 10 liters per minute, at low patient temperatures, less than 32 degrees Celsius, and with excessive patient leaks, more than 30% of inspired tidal volume. There is moderate inefficiency with prolonged use. For the HME to function adequately, two-way gas flow is required. For optimal function, HME must be placed in the breathing system close to the patient to minimize the addition of dead space. HMEs are relatively bulky. 
Lastly, there is risk of circuit disconnection. Circle systems. This is a rebreathing system that can humidify inspiratory gases, which is widely used in anesthesia and has several advantages. Inspired gases are humidified and warm. It is economical as it conserves anesthetic gases, heat and moisture. There is minimal pollution as anesthetic gases are recycled. Low flow anesthesia can be employed. There is low dead space and there is low risk of soda lime dust inhalation unlike the water circuit. The absorption of CO2 by soda lime generates water and heat and so within a circle breathing system, humidity increases with time. Although this process is relatively slow, taking up to an hour, the humidifying property of soda lime can achieve an absolute humidity of 29 mg per liter when used within the circle breathing system. Soda lime is the substance used most commonly for CO2 absorption in rebreathing systems. The main purpose of soda lime is to allow the rebreathing of exhaled gases within breathing systems by absorbing exhaled CO2. It is originally used in the water circuit. Currently, it is used most commonly in the circle system. Large canisters containing up to 2 kg of soda lime are commonly employed. Soda lime composes of CaOH2 81%, bound water 15%, NaOH 4%, KOH less than 1% or nil. KOH was added as an accelerator, but this strong alkali has been implicated in the formation of carbon monoxide due to a reaction from isofluorine, amfluorine or desfluorine, and compound A due to a reaction from sevofluorine. Thus, KOH has been removed by manufacturers from soda lime. Silica 0.2% is also added to produce calcium and sodium silicate, which in trace amounts hardens the granules which would otherwise disintegrate into powder. The efficiency of CO2 absorption varies inversely with the granule hardness. Absorption of carbon dioxide by soda lime occurs by the following reactions. CO2 plus H2O becomes H2CO3. H2CO3 plus 2NaOH produces Na2CO3 plus 2H2O plus heat. Na2CO3 plus CaOH2 produces CaCO3 plus 2NaOH plus heat. The overall reaction is CO2 plus CaOH2 produces CaCO3 plus H2O plus heat. Para lime is another CO2 absorber used in circle systems and it composes of 20% barium hydroxide octahydrate and 80% calcium hydroxide. The absorption of CO2 by para lime generates water and heat which warms and humidifies inspired gases. Compared to soda lime, more water is liberated and less heat is generated when barium hydroxide reacts with CO2. Kindly refer to the video discussing CO2 absorbance for further details. Next is the cold water buff humidifier, which is frequently used as a method of humidifying supplemental oxygen in general watts. They work by passing or bubbling dry, fresh gas flow through a water reservoir at room temperature. The bubbles absorb water vapor as they pass to the surface of the reservoir. It is most effective at flows of less than 5 liters per minute and can achieve an absolute humidity of 10 to 20 mg per liter. It is inefficient, about 30%, and becomes even more so as the loss of latent heat of vaporization cools the water further. With higher gas flows, the water content and temperature of the gas becomes much lower and efficiency is reduced further. The hot water buff humidifier. It is used to deliver relative humidities higher than the heat and moisture exchange filter. It is usually used in intensive care units and is an active system which can achieve efficiency of more than 90%. It is a complicated system that consists of the humidification chamber tubing and water trap. The humidification chamber consists of the water reservoir and heating element. The water reservoir is a disposable reservoir of water with an inlet and outlet for inspired gases. Heated sterile water partly fills the container. The heating element is a thermostatically controlled heating element with temperature sensors both in the reservoir and in the breathing system close to the patient. 
Tubing is used to deliver the humidified and warm gases to the patient and should be as short as possible. The water trap is positioned between the patient and the humidifier along the tubing. It is positioned lower than the level of the patient to collect any excessive condensation. Such a reservoir needs to be emptied regularly to prevent colonization with bacteria. Mechanism of action. This device is powered by electricity and the water is heated between 45 and 60 degrees Celsius. Evaporation occurs as the water is heated. The fresh gas flow is passed through the humidification chamber so that it can be saturated with water vapor. This can either occur by allowing the fresh gas flow to pass over the water, bubble through the water, or come into contact with wicks or a perforated plate deep in the water to increase surface area available for evaporation. When the fresh gas flow passes over the water, dry cold gas enters the container where some passes close to the water surface gaining maximum saturation. Some gases passes far from the water surface gaining minimal saturation and heat. The container has a large surface area for vaporization to ensure that gas is fully saturated at the temperature of the water bath. This is the cascade humidifier which is a variation on the warm water bath Gas is allowed to bubble through a perforated plate. This maximizes the surface area which is exposed to water. The tubing has poor thermal insulation properties and this reduces temperature of inspired gases. This is partly compensated for by the release of the heat of condensation. By raising the temperature in the humidifier above the body temperature, it is possible to deliver gases at 37 degrees Celsius and be fully saturated. The temperature of gases at the patient's end is measured by a thermistor. Via a feedback mechanism, the thermistor controls the temperature of water in the container. The temperature of gases at the patient's end depends on the surface area available for vaporization, the flow rate and amount of cooling, and condensation taking place in the inspiratory tubing. Some designs have heated elements placed in the inspiratory and expiratory limb of the breathing system to maintain the temperature and prevent rain out or condensation within the tube. Potential issues Risk of thermal injury to the patient. This is minimized by thermostats. A second backup thermostat cuts in should there be a malfunction of the first thermostat. Overhumidification of inspiratory gases. The humidifier and water traps should be positioned below the level of the tracheal tube to prevent flooding of the airway by condensed water. Risk of infections. Colonization of the water by bacteria can be prevented by increasing the temperature to 60 degrees Celsius. However, this poses a greater risk for thermal injury. Risk of circuit disconnections. Electronic malfunction and overheating. Risk of electric shock. The humidifier may be large, expensive and can be awkward to use and ventilator malfunction which can occur in the presence of excessive water within the delivery system. Some modern breathing circuits have an expiratory limb created from material that is permeable to water vapor. Nebulizers These are used for humidification by producing a mist of water micro droplets suspended in a gaseous medium to deliver medications to peripheral airways or to deliver radioactive isotopes in diagnostic lung ventilation imaging. The design of nebulizers can be tailored to produce droplets of a particular size. Types includes the gas-driven jet nebulizer, spinning disc nebulizer, and ultrasonic nebulizer. Gas-driven jet nebulizer, mechanism of action. A high-pressure gas stream is directed onto an anvil or baffle and entrains water which then breaks into droplets. The device is compact, making it easy to place close to the patient. High-pressure gas flows through the venturi and this creates negative pressure. Fluid is then drawn up through the capillary tube and broken into a fine spray. The bottom end of the capillary tube is immersed in a fluid container. The top end of the capillary tube is close to a venturi constriction. Even smaller droplets can be achieved as the spray hits the anvil. 
The majority of droplets are in the range of 2 to 4 microns. These droplets tend to deposit on the pharynx and upper airway. A small amount of droplets reaches the bronchial level. Larger droplets of about 20 microns in size are also produced. Droplets with diameters of more than 5 microns fall back into the container, and those less than 4 microns float out with the fresh gas flow. Spinning Disc Nebulizer It draws water onto a rotating disc, and this centrifugal force generator produces micro droplets. The ultrasonic nebulizer is a highly efficient method of humidification of inspiratory gases and to deliver drugs to the airway. A piezoelectric transducer head vibrates at ultrasonic frequency. The transducer can be immersed into fluid or fluid can be dropped onto it. Droplets of less than 1 to 2 microns in size are produced. Droplets of less than 1 microns are deposited in the alveoli and lower airways. The ultrasonic nebulizer is not commonly used as they can deliver gas with more than 100% relative humidity and therefore cause overload of the pulmonary tree with fluid, which can impair gas exchange and cause atelectasis. Nebulized droplets can also function as an ideal carrier for microbes, so it is essential that the water used is sterile. What are the effects of droplet size on humidification of inspiratory gases? Droplet size of less than 0.5 microns pass in and out of the respiratory cycle and can be carried out with the expired gases. Droplet size of 0.5 to 1 microns will be deposited in the alveoli and this is optimal. Droplet size of 2 to 5 microns are deposited within the bronchial tree. It may also be deposited in the trachea and help loosen secretions. This will not humidify the distal airways and will not deliver a drug dose effectively. Droplet size of more than 5 microns can be deposited within the main airways, resulting in increased airway resistance. Droplet size of more than 20 microns will not travel further than the upper airway and may condense out in the equipment tubing itself. Comparison of the efficiency of inhaled gas humidifiers, cold water buff, 10 grams per meter cube, HME, 25 grams per meter cube, hot water buff, 40 grams per meter cube, gas-driven nebulizer, 60 grams per meter cube, ultrasonic nebulizer, 90 grams per meter cube. Fully saturated air at 37 degrees Celsius contains 44 grams per meter cube of water. Does any device producing more than this amount risk over-humidification and potentially can cause pulmonary fluid accumulation? These are my references. Thank you.